Finally, the first of those incarcerated for participating in the January 6th demonstration have petitioned for a writ of habeas corpus. What does this mean? What are the constitutional issues and why should this be important to all Americans? We'll discuss that next on the Constitution Study. Hello there, everyday Americans, and welcome to the Constitution Study. I am glad you could join me. My name is Paul Engel. As always, find out more about what we're doing at constitutionstudy.com. Right now, I am putting together my 2022 tour. I'm calling it the Securing the Blessings of Liberty Tour. At least that's what I'm calling it now. And if you want to find out more, go to constitutionstudy.com slash tour. Check out the page. I'm still updating the page. A lot of it still has information from last year. But most importantly, at the bottom of the page is a form. If you would like me to come speak to your event, to your group, or just sit down and have a bunch of coffee with people, fill out that form. I'll contact you, and we'll see if we can't make this happen. Now, I'll talk more about the website and what's going on at the end of the program. But right now, let's talk about habeas corpus. Christopher Quaglin has petitioned the District Court for Washington, D.C. for a writ of habeas corpus. I will not be going into the details of Mr. Quaglin's case in this episode. That's fodder for another day. Rather, I want to focus on the writ itself and why it is so important to protecting our liberty. Now, to understand what this petition means and why it's important, we need a basic understanding of what habeas corpus is. Latin for you have the body, habeas corpus is a writ or a court order that commands an individual or a government official who has restrained another to produce the prisoner at a designated time and place so that the court can determine the legality of custody and decide whether to order the prisoner's release. In short, Mr. Quaglin is asking for his day in court. Specifically, he claims that he is being held illegally and he wants a court's opinion on the matter. Now, his petition accuses those in the federal prison system of some truly terrible treatment as justification of his request. So he is asking the court to issue an order for Merrick Garland as Attorney General for the United States and Ted Hull as the superintendent of the Northern Neck Regional Jail to bring him to court so he can make his case. Now, this ability to petition for a writ of habeas corpus is protected by the Constitution of the United States under Article 1, Section 9, Clause 2, which reads... The privilege of a writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless, when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. This is where we find that not only do words matter, but allowing people to manipulate them for their own gain is extremely dangerous. Since January 6, 2021, there are those in politics and the media who have claimed that the demonstration was an insurrection, which is defined as arising against civil or political authority, the open and active opposition of a number of persons to the execution of a law in a city or state. January 6 was not a rise against civil or political authority. Neither was it in opposition to the execution of a law. Instead, it was a demonstration to require our elected employees in Congress to follow the supreme law of the land, the Constitution of the United States. Did some people enter the Capitol? Yes. Did a few do damage? Yes. Was it an insurrection? No. Yet that has not stopped some from attempting to disqualify some candidates for their participation in the demonstration. Neither was the demonstration a rebellion, which is defined as an open and avowed renunciation of the authority of the government to which one owes allegiance, or the taking of arms traitorously to resist the authority of lawful government, a revolt. Since the demonstrators were protesting the illegal counting of votes from presidential electors who were not legally appointed, they were trying to uphold the government they owed allegiance to, not renounce it. The government of the United States was created by its constitution and is subject to the rules and restrictions documented within. In this day and age, though, it appears many Americans won't let little things like the law or the definition of a word get in the way of a political agenda. Since there was no rebellion, no invasion, and no public safety was threatened by Mr. Quaglin, I see no reason why the court should deny his petition. And again, we stopped treating the Constitution as the supreme law of the land decades ago. From Mr. Quaglin's petition, the Supreme Court has not definitively ruled as to whether a conditions of confinement claim is proper in habeas, but has instead called it an open question. 
In lieu of definitive ruling from the Supreme Court, circuit courts have stepped in to fill the void. One cohort of circuits favor a conditions of confinement claims while others oppose it. I have been asking attorneys for years if they studied the Constitution or constitutional law when they were in law school. To date, only one person said they studied the Constitution. The rest admitted that they studied the opinions of judges euphemistically referred to as constitutional law. Which is why I was not surprised to see the lawyer who is representing Mr. Quaglin acting as if, without a definitive opinion from the Supreme Court, courts opine, they don't rule, his client's right to habeas corpus is in jeopardy. Now, many of you may know that President Lincoln suspended the right of habeas corpus at the beginning of the Civil War. What you may not know is the story around it. On April 27, 1861, President Lincoln issued a proclamation suspending the right of habeas corpus for anyone held in a military facility by sentence of a military court-martial or military commission. Now, there were several problems with this proclamation. First, Nowhere in the Constitution is the President given the authority to suspend any legal protections. Since the language about suspending the right is in Article 1, which both establishes and sets the rules for the legislative branch, it can easily be assumed that any act involving habeas corpus would come from that branch, not the executive. Now, Some have pointed out that President Lincoln's order was limited to military facilities and cases coming from military courts. However, even though the President is the Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy, Article 2, Section 2, it's Congress that has been delegated the power to make the rules and regulations for those entities, Article 1, Section 8. Also, while the proclamation was limited to military courts, it was not limited to military personnel. The first challenge to Lincoln's proclamation came rather quickly. On May 25, 1861, John Merriman of Baltimore was arrested by Union troops and petitioned for a writ of habeas corpus. On May 26, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court Roger B. Taney issued an order to General George Codwalder, commander of Fort McHenry, to produce Mr. Merriman for a hearing to justify his detainment. The general replied that he was acting under orders of the president to suspend habeas corpus. Chief Justice Taney found the General Codwalder was in contempt of court and ordered the U.S. Marshals to seize him and bring him before the justice. It shouldn't be much of a surprise that the U.S. Marshals were not allowed to enter Fort McHenry and were therefore unable to seize him. And so Chief Justice Taney filed a written opinion with the Circuit Court for the District of Maryland, arguing that President Lincoln had no authority to suspend habeas corpus or to order military officers to do so. Now, the controversy continued until Congress passed and President Lincoln signed the Habeas Corpus Suspension Act of March 3, 1863. For two years, America had a suspension of constitutionally protected rights based solely on an illegal presidential order. Does that sound familiar to anyone? While Lincoln was the only president I'm aware of who unilaterally suspended habeas corpus, that was not the last time it was illegally suspended. In 2006, Congress passed and President George W. Bush signed the Military Commissions Act of 2006. This legislation included a suspension of habeas corpus. No court, justice, or judge shall have jurisdiction to hear or consider an application for a writ of habeas corpus filed by or on behalf of an alien detained by the United States who has been determined by the United States to have been properly detained as an enemy combatant or is awaiting such determination. Now, while this suspension of habeas corpus is usually attributed to President Bush, it was Congress that passed the legislation and the president who signed it. Since there was neither rebellion nor invasion in the United States in 2006, this act violated Article 1, Section 9, Clause 2 of the Constitution, making it both illegal and void. All this leaves us to the question of what the District Court for the District of Columbia will do. Will they recognize Mr. Quaglin's right to have his detention reviewed by the court, or will they take a look at the opinions of previous Supreme Courts and waffle? Time will tell. Meanwhile, what does this mean for the rest of America? If a year of pretrial detainment, along with accusations of abuse and the denial of due process, are not enough to have a case reviewed, what would happen to someone who stands up against an illegal action by a government agent? Can you be held indefinitely for not allowing police to enter your home without a warrant or for refusing to comply with an illegal mandate? Can you be labeled an insurrectionist or a rebel without proof? What good are your rights to due process if the process isn't followed? What happens if the court denies Mr. Quaglin's petition? 
Will the American people meekly stand by and watch while a federal citizen's rights are trampled? If the American people will not stand up to protect the rights of this man, who do you think will stand up if and when your rights are ignored? To paraphrase Martin Niemöller, first they came for the Trumpists, and I did not speak out because I was not a Trumpist. Then they came for the vaccine hesitant, and I did not speak out because I was not vaccine hesitant. Then they came for the January 6th demonstrators, and I did not speak out because I was not a January 6th demonstrator. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. Habeas corpus is one of those words we're all aware of, but very few of us actually know what it means. I found it very interesting to research the, the, um, the Latin and the understanding of habeas corpus and its import to a free people. So I, I hope Mr. Quaglin's petition is approved, and I hope he gets his day in court. Whether he does or not, I hope the American people will stand with him to make sure he gets a fair hearing. If there's a just cause for him to remain detained, well, then he should be detained. If it's found that his accusations of ill treatment are ill-founded, that's fine. But if he is wrongfully detained, and if his accusations are found to be plausible, not only should he sue, he must sue. And in fact, I would say there must be criminal charges. If you can be held without trial for an extended period of time in the types of conditions Mr. Quaglin describes in his petition, that is a crime. The only difference between that and crimes against humanity are the number of people treated that way. America should not be a place where the people fear their government. It should be a place where the government fears the people. Now, if you want to learn more, as always, you can find this episode and so much more at ConstitutionStudy.com. And please, I hope you will join me at one of my events. Go to ConstitutionStudy.com slash tour to find out where I'll be speaking and to invite me to come speak to you. I don't charge for these events. If you don't charge people to show up, I don't charge you to speak to them. I'm working on a travel budget so I can travel the country to speak to people. I think it's important. And every time I've done it, we've had a great time. I love meeting people, talking to them face to face, shaking hands, swapping stories. It's a great time. And everybody learns something. So again, that's constitutionstudy.com slash tour to find out more. Now, if you'd like to join me for my online study, we're still studying the Constitution, uh, online through a Zoom call. Go to constitutionstudy.com slash study and find out more. You can even try it for free. The first three lessons where we cover the Bill of Rights are absolutely free. Again, that's constitutionstudy.com slash study to find out more. Most importantly, please take this episode, take the article, take whatever you find on constitutionstudy.com and share it. It is free for you to use. It is free for you to share. We want to take these blessings of liberty and spread them like seeds in a field. Can you join me in that task? Can you join me in spreading the blessings of liberty? I'm trying to do it through my interviews and the radio program and through this tour. But hopefully, once I've given you some of these seeds, you can spread them elsewhere. If we're going to secure the blessings of liberty, it's going to take the American people doing their duty to help spread the word. And hopefully... You'll encourage some people to join us right here at the Constitution Study. There's one thing.